Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Navigating NIL, What It Means for the University of Minnesota. My name is Marissa Smith with the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, and before I introduce today's presenter, I have just a couple of announcements. First off, initiatives like our webinar series are made possible by our Alumni Association members. So if you're joining today's session as a member, thank you so much for your support. And if you're interested in becoming a member of the Alumni Association and supporting our work, check us out online at umnalumni.org slash membership. Secondly, we are recording today's webinar and we'll share it with you after the session wraps up. You will find today's recording and hundreds of other talks from alumni and university experts on UMAA's gold mine. Without further ado, I am pleased to introduce today's presenter. Jeremiah Carter was named Senior Associate Athletic Director for NIL Policy and Risk Management in March of 2023. In this role, he is responsible for identifying and managing issues related to emerging structural changes within college athletics. These responsibilities include managing the university's name, image, and likeness activities, adherence to university policies, and governance. Carter brings significant experience to this position as he's a former Gopher student athlete and has also served as an administrator at the University of Minnesota and the NCAA. Carter began his playing career at Minnesota as a walk-on member of the football team in 1998 under former head coach Glenn Mason. When his career came to an end in 2002, he was a two-year starter on the offensive line and had earned all Big Ten and academic all Big Ten honors. Jeremiah later joined the coaching ranks at Minnesota, where he was an offensive graduate assistant coach working with the offensive line, quarterbacks, and wide receivers until 2007 when he joined the NCAA staff. He's a native of St. Paul, Minnesota, and a two-time Gopher alumnus, having earned a BA in 2002 and an MED in 2006. Please join me in welcoming Jeremiah Carter. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. So. Um... I am uh, really, really happy uh, to be able to join you all today. And um, uh, most importantly, I, I want to thank the uh, Alumni Association for uh, providing this opportunity to come on and uh, educate everyone with uh, information about name, image, and likeness. Uh, I know it seems like a big kind of crazy, scary uh, space. Wild West is, is usually how it's described, but um, I think it's really important for everybody to understand what NIL is at Minnesota, because what you've read about, what you've seen it is not necessarily what it is at Minnesota. So I'm happy to be able to share that with you today. So first thing I want to be able to talk to you about is just kind of the background of NIL, how we got to where we are, um, where we are. So our current landscape, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about collectives, what they are, what they can do. Uh, and then, you know, what is what does NIL look like at Minnesota? Um, we are going to leave um, a lot of time at the end for questions. Uh, I find that most people uh, are, are very curious about NIL and, and have lots of questions. And um, so we always like to leave a lot of time for that. But I, I will hit a couple of uh, frequently asked questions first uh, to hopefully head off some of those questions that we have. So starting uh, July 1, 2021, um, student athletes were allowed to begin profiting from their name, image, and likeness. Uh, before that, you know, um, I, I would usually describe to student athletes, hey, you can go out and get a job at McDonald's flipping burgers, but if McDonald's wants to put you uh, in an advertisement, um, that's against NCA rules because you're using your appearance to promote a commercial entity. Um, NIL is really, really any activity where a student athlete is, is using their name, their image, or their likeness, or their status as a student athlete for a commercial purpose. Bottom line, it's a job, right? Now it's a job where student athletes get to uh, get to use their name, image, their likeness, their appearance um, to profit, but ultimately it is a job. They're doing work and they're getting paid for that work. So what happened to cause this change, uh, of course, for the NCAA, right? Now I have watched uh, every minute of every congressional hearing uh, uh, in front of the U.S. government. We've had uh, we've had I think uh, six or seven at this point uh, between the House and the Senate, and I can tell you that even our our senators uh, and our our Congress people um, get this mistake. And so I'm going to 
I'm going to give this to you and you're going to walk away from here smarter than a senator. Okay, you ready? Um, it was not the Alston Supreme Court case that changed the NIL rule with the NCAA. Okay, just for emphasis, it was not the Alston Supreme Court case that changed this. What ultimately changed uh, the NCAA's course is that in uh, 2019, California passed a, a law that said in the state of California, no co uh, collegiate institution and no organization that they belong to, NCAA, can stop a student athlete from using their name, image, and likeness to do an endorsement deal. Originally, that was set to take uh, effect on January 1st of 2023. But shortly after uh, California passed that law, a number of other states said, wait a second, that makes a lot of sense for the schools in our state. And if we don't do something like this, our schools will fall behind. So that started a process of kind of leapfrog with different state governments to the point where now uh, uh, by the uh, uh, end of uh, 2020, Florida had passed a law that said that beginning July 1, 2021, student athletes in the state of Florida could not be prohibited from using their name, image, and likeness to profit. So the Austin Supreme Court case was about something completely different. The decision happened to come in June of 2021. Um, and so many people equate the two, but it, but it was really these state laws um, that caused the NCAA to make that change. Um, and that's important because it still plays, the state law portion of it still plays a, an active role in NIL today. So there's really kind of been three phases of NIL. The first one was kind of the testing phase, right? We saw these, these big campaigns from groups like Barstool, Yo Gaming, um, to really just sign as many student athletes as possible. Um, but they didn't really have a plan. So even, you know, Barstool said, hey, we're, we're signing hundreds of student athletes across the country um, with the largest organization there is. We have no idea what we're going to do with them. They were getting a T-shirt and, and getting to put the uh, Barstool brand ambassador on their uh, social media, but that was about it. Started to see a couple of national brands. So this is an ad from PetSmart with a, a football student athlete and, and his pet. Um, you know, we saw a couple of, of national brands kind of dip their toes in the water, but they didn't really know what the value was. They didn't know how to value student athletes, but you had student athletes step out and be influencers using social media, being content producers. Um, some interesting ones, this is a, an NHL team paying a football student athlete at the University uh, uh, of Florida, uh, he might have been Miami, um, to promote the NHL team, right? That's, they want college night, they want as many student athletes, as, as many students uh, as possible, so they paid him to be an on-campus influencer. And then, of course, what would NIL be without, uh, you know, without a truck, right? So um, these are the types of things that we saw kind of in the first couple of months, right? In addition to that, we saw people very quickly start to try and test the NCAA's guidelines, right? NCAA says we can do this, this, and this. Uh, let, let's see what they're going to do about it. The very first one, you see the date on this is July 7th, six days after the NCAA rule changed. Uh, you had a, a, a booster in Miami, um, not the booster that you've heard so much about if you've been paying attention nationally, but a booster at the University of Miami um, who owned an MMA gym say, okay, uh, I'll give every player $500 uh, on the football team to promote my gym, right? Um, you know, that's where it started to get a little bit um, outside of just kind of traditional name, image, and likeness. Um, you also had, you know, the NCA said institutions can't be involved. And um, again, less uh, about a month and a half in, you had BYU, uh, you know, the BYU football strikes an NIL deal uh, to pay for tuition for walk-on players. Well, uh, it sounds like institutional involvement to me, um, but the, these boundaries were, were kind of tested over and over. And as it went on and, and individuals saw the NCA not doing anything in this area, they continued to kind of push the envelope. So Michigan State, this was an early one, um, football and basketball players, um, every uh, every football and basketball players uh, had the opportunity to sign with this lending company. 
uh, for $500 a month for the whole year. So very quickly, we went from $500 total to promote this MMA gym um, to $500 a month for the entire year to promote a, a lending company. Now that lending company happened to be owned by a, a prominent, um, uh, prominent Michigan State uh, supporter uh, who, who was a billionaire and was okay with that. Um, you know, but this is where we started to kind of separate student athletes, maybe their real NIL value from what what boosters were doing. Um, because, uh, you know, frankly, if, uh, you know, you're, you want to, you're going to listen to somebody about where to get a mortgage from. And, uh, when you're buying a house, uh, you know, why not listen to an 18 year old who's never owned a house or had a mortgage. Right. Um, so then in November of 2021, in the first year, uh, this is really where we started to see this, this third party growth. And, and what does that mean and, and why? Right. So, uh, it was the first open period of recruiting in the sport of football. Not a coincidence that this is when we saw this explosion of third party involvement with NIL. Uh, transfer portal opens in December, which allows student athletes to transfer. Uh, they also, their first uh, opportunity to sign high school students uh, to a financial aid agreement is in December. And uh, we saw it start to get involved in the recruiting process. A few schools, began creating these things called collectives and they were associating them with a specific team at an institution or in some cases a specific position on a team at the institution. A collective is, is really um, a, a place where boosters or fans can, can pool resources together to make sure that student athletes um, have uh, NIL opportunities at the institution of their choice. Important to note, these weren't run by institutions and there were kind of varying level of institutional involvement. So the third phase since then is, um, you know, the, the NCAA membership has, has embraced it and, and really moved forward with it in a lot of sports and um, it, it can best be described as chaos, right? Um, you know, the N NIL has moved into the recruiting and retention space for student athletes even though the NCAA kind of gave us some guidelines to say no. Uh, NCAA enforcement uh, made a couple of rule changes and, and has had an NIL um, violation case, but that really hasn't slowed stuff down very much. Uh, 32 states have passed NIL laws. The reason why that's important is because they haven't just stayed with the NIL laws that they passed originally. They've continued to evolve and kind of one up each other in terms of what their state allows universities in their state to do. That's a problem because it's created kind of a patchwork of state laws and there's not there's not really a common set of rules. There's NCA guidance, but there's not really a common set of rules that all institutions are, are following. So what are these NIL guidelines, right? What are the guardrails that are up? Uh, I'll say something about this first and just generally speaking, I, you know, I've been at Minnesota quite a long time. Um, I was the director of athletic compliance here. So responsible for NCA rules for 10 years um, after having worked at the NCA. And I can tell you that, that um, you know, Minnesota can only be Minnesota and, and we are going to do things, um, we're gonna do things the right way. That doesn't mean we're not going to be competitive. It's not going to. It's not. Uh, doesn't mean we aren't going to do everything we can under the rules. But ultimately, we are going to do what the rules allow us to do. So this is what we operate under. Um, so current NCA guidance for student athletes. So one, they have to be paid for work performed, and they have to be paid at the going rate. Now, the going rate can be a difficult thing to establish. So uh, you, we do our best to to see what comes in and make sure that it it makes sense, right? Um, there has to be a quid pro quo, right? So it's not um, it's not just here, here's a stack of money, thank you, and move on. Um, they have to be doing work, um, and I can tell you that our student athletes are. Um, a couple of the restrictions, so it it can't be um, an NIL agreement for a student athlete can't be tied to their enrollment at a specific institution. It can't be used as a workaround for pay for play. Meaning it can't be, you know, you're a member of the team. Um, so just because you're a member of the team, you know, here's five thousand dollars. That's um, that would be against NCA rules. Uh, offers can't be made during the recruiting process. 
So uh, that NCA has a rule against offers and inducements. You can't, you can't promise somebody, if you come to Minnesota, you will get X amount of money uh, with NIL. Um, and then lastly, student athletes uh, can't be paid directly or indirectly for promoting an athletics event that they are participating in. Now, some of the restrictions around what an institution, what a university is allowed to do, um, includes uh, staff at the university or staff in the athletic department. Um, so staff are permitted to purchase items related to a student athlete's NIL deal that are uh, dim so you know that are cheap, right? Um, and as long as they're available for the same rate um, as the going as the general public. So you know I can buy my kids a, a jersey, um, or you know we have a, a couple of student athletes who produce music. You know you can purchase that without without an issue. Um, we're allowed to provide financial literacy, we're allowed to provide branding education for student athletes, and, and then we're allowed to proactively reach out to local businesses. Uh, we're allowed to pay uh, for and create a marketplace for student athletes to connect with potential businesses. But what we can't do is we cannot compensate a student athlete for their NIL. Neither uh, the University of Minnesota nor the Big Ten Conference is allowed to pay a student athlete for the use of their name, image, and likeness in any way. We also can't provide tax services or legal advice unless it's open to all students at the university. And we are not permitted to proactively assist in the development, creation, execution, or implementation of a student athlete's NIL. So what does that mean? If a student athlete signs a, um, an NIL deal with, you know, with Cub Foods, um, that means that our institution is, uh, our, our athletic department creative staff isn't allowed to help them make the ad. So um, there, the guardrails that are in place kind of at the national level are, you know, they're not, they're not super um, detailed or, or, or restricted, but, um, but these, are, these are the ones that, um, that, that we're bound to and that we follow. So the university has a uh, has a name, image, and likeness policy that that's administered by the athletic department, um, and that is uh, that that was put into place on July one. Uh, the state of Minnesota does not have an NIL law, which uh, has allowed us as an institution to kind of set the boundaries of where we want to be. The goal of of the policy was to be um, the least restrictive we could possibly be while still making sure that student athletes are following NCA guidelines, as well as some of the other university policies. So as an example, there are policies around um, use of, of facilities, right? You got to pay the going rate. There are uh, university rules around using the, the block M, using the marks and logos. Those are protected trademarks. There are university rules around that. There are university rules about filming, commercial filming on campus. You have to have permission to do that. Um, all of those things are, are kind of built into the policy so that if a student athlete is following the policy um, and, and we help guide them through that, they know that they are good with uh, the University of Minnesota and they're good with NCA guidelines. Our compliance office is responsible for making sure that the policy is met and student athletes submit a little information to them to make sure that they uh, know what, uh, know what they're, they're doing and, and what they're allowed to do. So that brings us to um, collectives. Um, you know, this was a, a cover of Sports Illustrated about a year and a half ago. Um, and this was a, a, a somebody who ran a, a collective that said, you know, we're looked at as a necessary evil. Um, I, I, you know, I frankly don't, don't view it that way myself. Um, I believe that they are providing a valuable service to, um, to our student athletes, to our fans. Um, and to local businesses, um, but it's there is no doubt that in in the current landscape of college athletics, especially uh, at our level, at the uh, the biggest uh, universities um, at in uh, the NCAA, um, they are uh, collectives are an absolute necessity. So, what is a collective? So, this is an area where where there's really kind of been explosive growth over the last. Uh, over the last 24 months. So in November of 2021, there were six collectives in the entire country, right? Um, I think two of them were at the University of Texas, uh, both for football. Uh, one of them was a, uh, you know, one of them was specific to the offensive line, which as a former offensive lineman, uh, you know, I love that, good for them. Um, but, you know, uh, one was uh, for, for uh, I think, quarterbacks. Um, 
So, you know, it started off at six. Now we're in a place where across the country, there are over 200 uh, that have registered at some point. A collective, simply put, is a group of individuals, donors, fans, who organize themselves with the goal of marketing or compensating student athletes at a specific institution. Uh, collectives are uh, oftentimes formed uh, or run by uh, former student athletes, by boosters, uh, by alumni of the institution, um, but they're not formally affiliated with the university um, or the athletic department. Some of them have branded themselves as nonprofit organizations. Uh, not all of them, even though they say they're a nonprofit, not all of them have a 501c3 status from the IRS. Um, but others have have chosen to incorporate themselves as as LLCs as businesses. So a collective, it's important to know what they do. They they all operate differently, and we will talk in just a little bit about the um, one specific to the University of Minnesota. Um, but they they all work a little bit differently. But bottom line. They exist to make sure that student athletes at their at their chosen institution, at the institution that they work with, have name, image, and likeness opportunities that they can take advantage of. There's two main types of them. Uh, one is kind of like a marketing or agency collective, and really uh, the goal there is to work with local businesses and, or fans that are looking to use a student athlete's name, image, and likeness to promote their commercial venture. It helps uh, mediate, mediate those discussions, it helps collect payment, uh, and they help, help make payments. There are also some that uh, are, are more direct pay. So they look at um, either local nonprofits or um, work with donors to basically collect money and then make sure that um, student athletes get paid for doing um, charitable work. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, a hybrid really kind of leverages both. It uses some money from supporters of an institution and some money from other, other places to, um, to help uh, student athletes use their NIL and, and have deals in place for their name, image, and likeness. So the current NCA guidance, right? So we went in, in um, July of 2021, we had, you know, there's no such thing as a collective. The NCA put their guidelines out. In November, we had a couple. Um, and then, you know, a couple of months later, there were there were dozens. Um, then there was over 100, and, and now there, there are 200. And the NCAA has laid out guidelines about what collectives are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. So the starting point, and I think this is something that's important to know because this is mainly where collectives have been talked about publicly over the last um, over the last year, um, is, is what role do they have in the recruiting process? What can a collective do in the recruiting process? Under NCA rules, the answer is nothing. They're not allowed to have contact uh, with. Uh, student athletes or, uh, with prospective student athletes. They're not allowed to make offers to prospective student athletes. Um, bottom line is once a student, uh, once an individual becomes a student athlete, so a high school student enrolls or a transfer student enrolls and they become a student athlete for the University of Minnesota, that is the first time that a collective is allowed under NCA rules to have contact with them to make an offer. Having said that, uh, I've been in college athletics a long time. Uh, you know, a good NCA rule has never stopped somebody from trying to find a way around it. Um, so it doesn't mean that all schools are, are following this to the letter, but, um, but this is what the NCA rule says. So that brings me to the University of Minnesota Collective. So Dinkytown Athletes uh, is a collective that works directly with the University of Minnesota. Um, they are the official NIL collective of Gopher Athletics. Some important things to note, that's a paid designation, just like, you know, a, a bank is the official banking partner of Gopher Athletics. That is something that they are required to pay for. 
through our uh, Gopher Sports Properties, which manages all of our marks and logos. NCA rules require that they're paying the going rate, and, and so that's what they do. Um, that gives them some in-venue advertising um, and, and a few other things, but um, ultimately they, they launched a little over a year ago in September of 2022. They, uh, a couple things about them. That, so it was started by a former football student athlete. Um, uh, Derek Burns is, is the president of Dinkytown Athletes. Um, his uh, business partner is longtime Gopher, uh, Gopher fan and Gopher supporter, uh, Rob Gag. He serves as the, the vice president. Um, they work exclusively with University of Minnesota student athletes. Um, they operate as a not-for-profit LLC but not a nonprofit, not a 501c3. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in, in just a minute. Um, memberships and sponsorships are really kind of key to long-term stability. And, and we'll talk about that here. So um, they have four main branches of their business, right? And the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this is because it's, um, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit later, but um, ultimately the recruiting landscape um, requires a, a, having a strong collective. That's that's where we are at um, in college athletics, and, and Minnesota um, has Dinky Town athletes for our collective. So they have four main branches of their their um, business that are all intended to work together. Um, the first one is memberships. So um, fans uh, can sign up for them. There's a, a range of things that they can um, that they that they get in exchange for it, but most importantly the money that comes in from these memberships is used for student athletes to pay for their name, image, and likeness for things like um, interviews, videos, um, autograph memorabilia. Um, it's kind of a, a one place that, that Gopher fans can go to um, to know that their dollars will go to name, image, and likeness because as I've mentioned, the, the university is not allowed to, um, to do that directly. So the second thing that Dinkytown Athletes does is they work with businesses. So they make sure that student athletes have uh, NIL opportunities and, and more importantly, so that businesses have a place to go when they want to work directly with a student athlete or multiple student athletes at the University of Minnesota. Um, eases a lot of burden for them. Um, it's kind of one payment instead of having to find five different student athletes, um, don't have to have contractors and then um, also, you know, business does not have to risk their campaign on a single student athlete. Um, they can kind of diversify that a little bit. Uh, like many, um, they they uh, like many collectives. They also have supporters who are just um, directly providing payments because they want to make sure that um, student athletes have NIL opportunities. Um, that goes to um, support a, a number of different things with them, but ultimately. Um, whether it's memberships or supporters, um, those entities, uh, those, those individuals have the choice of, of where they want their, their money to go from an NIL perspective, what team they want it to go to, um, or, or what individual they want to make sure has those NIL opportunities. The last category for them is passive income, and this is really kind of a new product category for them, but that gets them into um, product collaboration, where they have existing businesses, that they work with. So here are a couple that have been launched this year. So they're working with Parlor Burger, who um, has a, a spot in Huntington Bank Stadium, um, and they are uh, uh, donating proceeds from sales in Huntington Bank Stadium um, directly to Dinky Town Athletes. Um, they launched a, a beer uh, with uh, with a Minnesota company called Gray Duck uh, this year, where uh, twenty percent of the um, twenty percent of the proceeds um, is provided directly to Dinky Town Athletes. Um, there's also an entity called Team Dinky Town Realty. Uh, again, they're working with Dinky Town athletes to, um, you know, all of the individuals you see in picture in the pictures there are all uh, current University of Minnesota student athletes who were paid um, to appear in um, to appear in those advertisements and um, and help with uh, promoting um, uh, promoting real estate uh, uh, across the across the metro area. So, so far in this year, they, they've worked uh, with uh, student athletes from 11 sports. Uh, their goal is to continue to expand, um, but it really, it kind of tracks closely with uh, contributor uh, intent and member in interest. They're, they're not a 501c3 and um, 
honestly don't know if that will happen. In the month of May, the IRS put out a memo that um, said, hey, we, we see these things called collectives that are operating as charities and um, uh, collecting money and then paying people to do volunteer, what's normally volunteer work, doesn't really count as a charitable purpose. So, um, so that, that's posing a challenge to, challenge to existing um, uh, entities that have a 501c3, um, but also um, likely, you know, likely prevents um, uh, new ones from happening as well. But ultimately, they're not allowed in the, the recruiting process. So uh, this next slide, I just uh, wanted to show you something uh, cool that they worked on that, that kind of shows how um, they work with an athlete to help them capitalize on their name, image, and likeness. So, um, you know, those of you who were uh, around for the first game of the season this year uh, against Nebraska uh, may remember this, uh, you know, um, pretty awesome uh, thing that happened with uh, uh, Daniel Jackson made an amazing catch on our football team um, to uh, help take the lead against, uh, against Nebraska just managed to get his toe in bounds. Um, the catch and then the photo that this was based on um, happened at 10.15, late game. <laughs> um, the end of the game uh, was 10.28, so game over at 10.28. By 11 fix, uh, by 11.56 that night, uh, Dinky Town Athletes had already signed Daniel to uh, a merchandise deal to help him capitalize on, um, on this. The design was complete um, by 1.16 the next afternoon, and it was on sale to the public in less than 24 hours. That's not something that the student athlete likely would have been able to do on their own. So having Dinkytown athletes for them to, um, to have to work with um, was a great, um, great resource for them. So there is university support, and we have seen a, a, a fair amount of corporate engagement. So on the university side, so we are permitted, if you remember back, we're permitted to provide um, legal advice if it's available to all students. Uh, the University of Minnesota Law School, um, in partnership with uh, in partnership with a, a law firm um, downtown, um, managed to to kind of get one up and running within a year. So this has been um, this has been running for over a year. Uh, Chris Pham with uh, Fredrickson and Byron downtown and um, and Taran Sharma um, have have worked with um, law school students uh, in the University of Minnesota Law School to provide contract review for students. Uh, for all students at the University of Minnesota when it's related to name, image, and likeness or an influencer deal. We've had a number of student athletes take advantage of this over the last year, and it's it's really beneficial uh, because ultimately, you know, we want to do everything we can to make sure that student athletes are well informed on what they, um, you know, what they are signing when they're signing a contract. We've also um, uh, Dinkytown Athletes has has partnered with um, the Leadership Lab um, within the Carlson School of Management. Um, this uh, this is a really cool program where uh, students in the Leadership Lab are uh, able to partner with a business um, every semester, and they kind of they kind of do a deep dive into a business problem for them um, and work through to solve it with them. And the Leadership Lab um, this semester was uh, was very interested in name, image, and likeness. So um, they are working with Dinky Town athletes on um, on both member memberships and businesses. And um, that's uh, they have two groups of students that are working through uh, all of those issues. And um, and at the end of the semester, we'll present uh, we'll present their findings. Um, and they've been a, a great partner for Dinky Town. The University of Minnesota, the athletic department, um, has an agreement with Fanatics um, that allows us to sell um, that, that allows Fanatics to sell student athlete apparel with their name, image, and likeness. Now, it's important to know that this is a deal um, between Fanatics and the student athlete. The University of Minnesota is not part of the deal, um, other than um, the fact that we have it on our fan shop. So, um, you know, this is this is great for student athletes who um, who choose uh, to opt in. Um, it's not a requirement. Um, if they choose to have their name there, um, they get royalties from the sales of uh, of those jerseys and shirts. 
We also have something called the University, the uh, Minnesota Marketplace. Um, this is a place where uh, businesses or individuals can connect directly with student athletes to help facilitate deals. And it provides a secure transaction for our student athletes. Ultimately, we want to look up, out for them and make sure that they're entering into um, good deals and that, that uh, they actually get paid for, for those deals. Our student athletes have done a tremendous job of being ambassadors for brands. Here are a couple on, on the left. Um, you know, some of these um, don't involve uh, university uh, marks and logos. So um, on the left, we have uh, um, Devin Eastern, who's a football student athlete. You know, as you can see, he's not not using any University of Minnesota um, uh, logos or, or anything like that. Um, working with uh, Hammer Strength um, to uh, to really kind of promote uh, promote their equipment. Um, on the right, um, you see um, a new ad going out with uh, Mara Braun, a women's basketball student athlete. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, it, it is using uh, university marks and logos. Um, as you can see, uh, it's Affinity Plus, and they're a proud sponsor of Gopher Athletics. So um, the reason why they, they have the marks and logos in there is because, um, you know, they have a partnership with um, a partnership with Gopher Sports Properties um, and, and are, um, are paying for that uh, engagement. So this is kind of a, a, a small sampling of some of the, the brands that University of Minnesota student athletes have um, have worked with. Um, it, it's pretty wide variety. It, it changes and, and increases every day. And um, these kind of day-to-day -day deals, um, some of them are, are negotiated um, by Dinky Town athletes. Some of them um, are directly with the student athletes. So as we kind of look to the future, um, you know, I, I wanted to kind of talk about what some of the challenges are. Um, it, NIL and and um, and access to NIL is not the um, is not the only thing that um, recruits and student athletes look at when they're choosing an institution. Like anything else, um, facilities, location, uh, the type of education that they are getting, does it align with the student athlete's interest? Um, what type of offense or defense do they play? What coach do they have? Those are all factors in the decision-making process for student athletes when they are choosing an institution. NIL opportunities and access to NIL opportunities and strength of the collective are now one of those factors that they are looking at. The recruiting involvement and tampering just, uh, you know, on the NCAA side, um, what, we'll, what we're looking for is, um, you know, what is the enforcement staff? What's the NCAA going to do to, to kind of help um, curb the tampering, right? Calling uh, coaches, calling somebody on another team and saying, hey, if you if you come to our school, you'll get X, Y, or Z. Um, we're also um, looking for what's, you know, what, what's sustainable, right? What's going to stabilize um, NIL from school to school. There, there is nobody with unlimited uh, with unlimited money, and collectives are funded in a lot of different ways. Like I said, every every school, every collective is a little bit different. Um, but what's going to uh, maintain that funding? All right. And then the last question is kind of you know, uh, with the collectives, with the third party, you know, what is the NCA going to allow them to do? How are they going to be able to be involved? So before we open it up for questions, which we will do now, um, I would say if if you do um, if you do have a question, feel free to to enter it into the the Q and A, um, and we'll start going through those um, so that we can be prepared to um, to answer them for you. Happy to answer anything that that uh, that might come up, um, but I do want to address some of the frequently asked questions. So. Um, I've got the uh, kind of, you know, been talking about this for, for quite a while uh, with NIL with people and um, I kind of developed a greatest hits of questions, right? Um, they're, they're, these are the four that I see the most often, right? When people um, recognize that, you know, NIL is a part of college athletics and, and there need to be those opportunities there um, to, from, a, uh, from a competitive standpoint. Um, these are kind of the top four questions that we get, right? One is why does the athletic department pay for this, right? Um, two, why aren't the Fortune 500 companies in the Twin Cities paying for this? 
you know, three, wh where are the big donors, right? Uh, school X, Y, or Z, um, you know, got, got $5 million and, you know, where are our donors doing that, right? And the fourth one is, you know, I see all of these big numbers. I've read about this online. How can Minnesota, how can Minnesota complete, compete, right? If we don't have that person given $10 million or whatever it is, how can we compete? So, so the first question, why doesn't the athletic department just pay for this, right? Why, you know, why are we looking to, why are we looking to fans, right? That, that, that is a question that we hear over and over again. Got a pretty simple answer. Uh, uh, NCA rules say that we can't do this. There are a lot of um, challenges to the uh, amateurism model that are working their way through various court systems. The federal government is looking at it. The National Labor Relations Board is looking at it. Um, all of those things are, are, are open questions. Um, but as far as right now, uh, Minnesota, we're, we're going to follow NCA rules, and NCA rules say that we can't um, we we can't pay student athletes for NIL, so we're not going to do that. Okay. So the next question, right? Why aren't the Fortune 500 companies paying for this? We we live in a state that has more Fortune 500 companies per capita than any other state. Um, uh, I, I think we're we're maybe first or second in the, in the country in the number of Fortune 500 com companies per capita. And I, uh, I fully appreciate that question. And having done this now um, for, for quite a while, um, I think we can best illustrate kind of the, the response with, with this, right? So if you think about it similarly to how we think about fundraising, right? Um, ultimately, we, we fundraise so that our student athletes and our teams have resources. Um, last year, uh, the total contributions to the University of Minnesota Athletic Department from a fundraising perspective were $45.1 million. Um, we've got a, a group of, of dedicated fundraisers. It's called the Golden Gopher Fund, and they fund, you know, it, they, they work to fund scholarships. They work to fund um, community service initiatives, um, you know, uh, access for uh, resources that teams need, all sorts of stuff. And, and they do a tremendous job doing it. But out of that $45.1 million, this is the breakdown of where that money comes from. So the biggest slice, this is the, you know, the, the slice of pie that I take um, on Thanksgiving, 57% comes from folks like you, from alumni. Thank you. Um, this, this allows us to do the things that we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? 40% um, comes from, from non-alumni people that just have an affinity for the University of Minnesota, even though they didn't, they didn't attend. 1% um, comes from faculty and staff. So folks that show up every day, right? And, and are working and on top of that are providing payment. And that little tiny gray slice up there that you see, that's the, uh, uh, the, the amount of pie that's left after you, you know, uh, it gets sliced down. That, that's the Minnesota, uh, Minnesota nice slice, right? That, two, that, that tiny amount, um, that's 2%. And that comes from corporations. And we have great corporate partners with Lando Lakes, um, that's a sponsor of Center for Excellence, um, 3M that that uh, works and and has sponsored our, our uh, Mariucci Arena. Um, however, uh, that's reality. That that's that's what we see in our in our philanthropic giving with corporations. So the next question is, where are the big donors? Right. Um, as you saw on the previous slide, $45 million a year is a lot of money to raise, and we do that. Um, it, it's incredibly hard work for our fundraisers to get to that level. Um, this is something that was posted uh, a couple months ago, um, and this is the, the kind of top 50 in college sports of how much the, uh, each school has received in donations um, from 2005 to 2022 based on um, information from USA Today. Minnesota's 48th, okay? That is, again, uh, that we, we could not do this without our donors, but, but that's, that's where we rank nationally. Um, why is that? Great question. If any of you have the specific answer and how to change that, please let me know. Um, but a couple things to look at. You know, Minnesota is number three in the most charitable states in America. Um, so we have people that give. However, when you really break that down, um, it really is more of a volunteer based um, uh, service action oriented base as opposed to um, dollars. So that's what we see. 
people offering to help, which is which is tremendous. Um, but it's not necessarily writing a big check for one thing or another. So the last thing I want to address before we we kind of turn this, um, you know, uh, turn it open for um, uh, for questions is um, how can we possibly compete? How can the University of Minnesota compete when I, you know I read about so much stuff going on, right? So as an example, a week ago, October 22nd, this is what ran in, in the New York Times, okay? Rich donors and loose rules are transforming college sports. There were lots of sensational things written in that article. Um, I can tell you a, a lot of them were accurate, not all of them were, but um, a lot of them are accurate. Quote that I will pull out, one player at a Big Ten institution now makes $750,000 a year, according to the group that pays him. That's a lot of money, right, for one student athlete. How can we compete with that, right? That is the question that we get over and over again. Um, I will say that NIL is not the only factor that student athletes take into account when choosing an institution, okay? Now, while they didn't say who exactly was receiving it, the New York Times did uh, talk about what team it was, okay? $750,000 a year for one player on the football team. How are we gonna compete? That was the team, Michigan State. How is Minnesota gonna compete? We already are, okay? We have nowhere near a player making $750,000, but it does not directly correlate to success on the field. Okay. Um, it's a factor that student athletes look at, but it's not the only factor. So as a fan, um, which if you've, if you've logged on uh, to this over lunchtime and, and listened to me go on for the last uh, 40, 45 minutes, um, I'm guessing that you're a fan. Um, the question is, you know, um, how can you get involved? Well, Number one, um, you know, companies, uh, companies that can benefit from a, a deeper connection with Gopher fans, they can hire student athletes, um, you know, hire student athletes directly or hire them through Dinky Town athletes for NIL deals. Um, as an individual, um, you know, it's one and one because it's, you know, it's one A, one B um, because they are, they're both equally important. Um, becoming a member of Dinky Town athletes, um, you know, at whatever level um, you, you can, you, you don't have to be able to, you, you don't have to be able to um, give $10,000 a year to do it. Um, every, every bit counts. And when you think about how many Gopher fans there are and how many season ticket holders we have, um, that really, um, it really starts to, um, it really starts to add up with, with memberships. Um, you can also, you know, learn more and share with other gophersports.com slash NIL has more information. It has my contact information. I'm more than happy to, um, to speak with folks. Um, and with that, uh, I think that, uh, we will, uh, we'll get started with some of the questions. Jeremiah, thank you so much for that overview. There was so much great content there. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure others on the call did too. Um, you covered a lot of the questions that have already come in, but I can highlight a few um, for you. And, and as uh, other folks have questions, do feel free to drop them in the Q&A um, text box. Uh, question, when do you think, or do you think the NCAA will allow schools to get more involved in NIL rather than outsourcing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and and one um, you know I um, love to have a crystal ball and tell you exactly when, where, how that's going to happen. Um, but I you know I can tell you that um, the challenge with it is that from a um, not to uh, not to yeah uh, not to get too deep into um, the legal aspects of it, but um, it really comes down to what it will the NCAA be able to do practically speaking um, from a um, from a legislation standpoint that they'll actually be able to enforce without state laws overriding it. Um, if you've um, if you've been paying attention again, I've, I've, I've watched every minute of every congressional hearing. Uh, it's a lot. Um, but the reason why the NCA keeps going back to the federal government is because they need a federal law that gives them preemption over state laws. And I just, I, I frankly don't know that that's going to happen. 
So, um, you know, at some point, the NCA will have to figure out a different solution to this because we can't keep going the way that we are. Another question that just came in is information about how much a student athlete is getting paid made public. Um, so that's that's not public information. Um, unless a student athlete chooses to make that public information. Um, now, that, that is based on Minnesota uh, public records laws. Uh, it, you know, it is student athletes um, report a, a limited amount of information um, to, um, to the compliance department to make sure that they are aligning with both NCAA guidelines and university policy. However, that, that is not um, that doesn't become public information because it's um, it's ultimately a student's data, um, and student data is protected under um, uh, under uh, state law. Um, you know that doesn't mean that it's going to be that way forever. Uh, you know the state of Utah just um, passed a, a, a just had a ruling that. Um, that does make that information reported to a university public, um, but of course that's that's under the state of Utah's laws, not not Minnesota. Um, and there's at this point there's no NCAA requirement to um, to create that and make that public. Um, doesn't mean the NCAA won't change that, but then you get back to the question of whether or not they can actually um, do something and enforce it. Mm. Couple of questions about it. You know, if a company donates a large amount, Fortune 500, for example, can they dictate exactly how it gets spent? Or connected to that, if uh, Dinky Town Athletes has a partnership with companies like the the uh, part of the proceeds go to Dinky Town Athletes, how do those profits get distributed to the athletes? Yeah. So. Um number of different ways. Um, so, so again, Dinky Town Athletes operates independent of the University of Minnesota. So um, the University of Minnesota, we, we don't dictate uh, where it goes. However, a company that's spending ad dollars does get to dictate exactly where it goes and exactly how they want it spent and exactly what they get in return. Um, I do think it's important to, to point out that when a company is spending money, on an NIL um, uh, endeavor with whether it's, you know, Dinky Town athletes or directly with a student athlete, um, you know, I, that's an that's an advertising budget, right? That's a that that is a, a legitimate advertising budget that that most companies have have written off as advertising. And ultimately the um, you know, the, the goal is to have as much exposure as possible for those student athletes that, that kind of helps them build their brand. And for the company, it helps that company um, build their brand and build um, the affinity um, with, with uh, Golden Gopher uh, fans. So um, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, if an uh, individual uh, purchases a membership, um, they can directly um, say what sport they wanted to go to, what student athlete they wanted to go to, uh, and then Dinky Town Athletes works out the activities um, to pay them for. Uh, but if a company is doing it from an advertising standpoint, um, they're purchasing advertising um, and Dinky Town works with them to make sure that the student athletes um, perform the, the duties that they want with that. What, um, what ways can a student athlete grow NIL opportunities for themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, that really comes down to branding and exposure. So absolutely, um, you know, want all of our student athletes to, um, you know, to have as many opportunities as possible, whether it's, whether it's through the collective or on their own. Um, at Dinky Town Athletes does not have, um, it's not an, an exclusive. So there are some collectives and there's some companies that, that will sign a student athlete and say, um, you can only work with us or for us. Um, Dinky Town Athletes does not um, sign exclusive agreements. So there are there are plenty of student athletes who have um, worked um, directly with companies um, and, and found their own NIL deals. Frankly, the, the most straightforward way there is to um, increase follower counts uh, on, on social media platforms, um, increase visibility, and um, by doing things like that, they become more attractive individually to, um, to a sponsor that wants to, um, that wants to reach that student athlete's audience. Interesting. Um, a question about international student athletes. How do you talk to international student athletes about NIL uh, since they aren't able to participate as freely as student athletes from the United States? 
Yeah, and so um, th thanks to whoever uh, asked that question, um, but that's uh, um, just so that we we kind of bring everybody along because that's a that's a that's a little bit in the weeds. Um, so uh, international uh, student athletes are um, like all students who are international are in the United States on a student visa. Um, a student visa does not allow the holder of that visa to work while they are in the country unless it is on campus and directly related to their, their field of study. And even then it's limited to 20 hours a week. So a lot of the traditional, um, a lot of the traditional things that uh, student athletes are doing um, to earn NIL money is not available to an international student athlete. As an example, an in-person appearance at, um, you know, at a local restaurant, right? Student athlete, an international student athlete wouldn't be able to do that because that would be working while they're in the United States on their student visa. Um, that has been, you know, advocating for international student athletes at the federal level has been a priority um, of both of the Big Ten Conference, the SEC Conference, um, trying to get that changed. Immigration law is very, very tricky and is a political hot potato, so there's not been an appetite for changing that. What we have seen and, um, you know, what we have seen some, some success with is um, international student athletes when they are at home, whether over a uh, vacation period or during the summer, they perform their work when they are at home or otherwise outside of the United States and get paid for it. And then that creates essentially ad collateral um, that a company can use later. Um, or, you know, in the case, if, if you look at um, Dinky Town athletes, um, you know, we have a couple of, of international uh, men's basketball players, um, women's basketball players, and um, they have been able to create content um, while they are home um, and, and uh, receive payment for that, like, like all other student athletes have. Great. We are coming up on the end of our time, so I think we'll wrap it up with uh, one more question. There's kind of a theme of questions that have come in around the future and kind of financial goals around Dinky Town athletes and NIL at the U of M. Kind of what are you looking ahead at um, and kind of where do you hope uh, this, this takes? Yeah, you know, that's a, it is a great question. Um, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of financial goals, um, you know, I would say, Ultimately, Dinky Town Athletes, um, you know, as uh, as an independent company, makes um, kind of sets those targets and and you know looks at their internal um, sales information and and you know and and knows where they are and where they want to get to. Um, ultimately, um, you know, as as we have discussed um, with them, that you know their ultimate goal is to be able to have enough. Um, membership support and donor support um, and, and company engagements um, to be able to support every student athlete at the University of Minnesota. Um, you know, that that obviously is, you know, that's an ambitious goal that, you know, uh, I hope that they reach that someday. Um, you know, I think every sport's a little bit different as far as where they are um, from a financial standpoint um, and, and the importance in, of it in the recruiting process. Um, you know, uh, on uh, the, the main sports where where we are seeing it at the University of Minnesota are football, men's and women's basketball, volleyball, and men's and women's. Uh, it is now started to move into men's and women's ice hockey. Um, so those are really, um, you know, those are really the spaces where there's where there's the most focus right now because from a recruiting standpoint, it comes up most in conversations in those sports. Um, you know, I think most um, just kind of using, um, there's no publicly available information about how much money collective, uh, you know, the Iowa collective or the Wisconsin collective has, so that makes it very difficult. Um, but, you know, I think, um, you know, conservative estimates would be, um, you know, that, that there's a uh, long-term goal of around um, four million dollars or so a year um, to operate with those sports, but then you know as sports grow and um, you know things are changing every day with NIL, so um, you know where they get to, um, you know uh, uh, who, who knows. I just you know I hope that um, 
Um, I hope that they are able to achieve what they're going for, which is supporting all University of Minnesota student athletes and um, and hopefully giving our, our fans uh, a great experience as well. Well, Jeremiah, thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise you. with us. This is a rapidly evolving area. We'll have to have you back in a year to, to hear everything that's evolved and changed. And um, just thank you again. And thanks to everybody um, who joined us today. We'll be sharing the recording out with you uh, in just a moment. And um, please do feel free to share it broadly um, so that the whole University of Minnesota community can be educated on this topic. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.